Again, it's good to see this number this evening. If you take your, your Bibles, we're going to be examining a man that we know of, Joseph Arimathea. And when you look at the New Testament passages concerning him, we can get a, a picture of what kind of man he, he was. Mark the 15th chapter in verse 43 says he was an honorable counselor. He was on the council of the Sanhedrin that would give judgments among to the people, among the Jews especially. But he was an honorable estate. He had a great reputation sitting on that board of counselors, and he was one of their counselors. And he was involved in giving those things. He was honorable. You can also say in Luke the 23rd chapter, verse 51, that in some passages he was waiting for the kingdom of God, but looking for it, waiting with anticipation. Here is the kingdom of God coming, and he was anxious for it to come in his day. What a blessing it would be because it was coming in his day, but he was looking for it. That's a wonderful thing about him. Thirdly, he was a righteous man, a good and just man. Righteousness means I will do justice. I will do that which is right, right in the sight of God. And he was a, a, a benefit to others. He was good in his character, beautiful in its character, and beneficial in his effect. And how he reacted and dealt with other people. The Bible also says in Luke 23 and verse 51, he did not consent to the Sanhedrin in their counsel and their deeds. They counseled, let's put him to death. Their deed, they did it. They had him executed, Roman style. They had him executed according to the Roman government and how they were put, to, put to away uh, criminals. And indeed he was one, I'm not with that group. Friend, just because you don't consent to something doesn't mean you're innocent. It doesn't mean that you're going to be saved because I didn't go along with them, so I'm not going to be guilty of things. That's not the case at all. But it's a noble thing. He said, I don't think that's right. But they crucified him anyway. But the Bible says this about him. He was a secret disciple. A secret disciple. John 19, 38, who's secret, and we know why. He feared the Jews. He was on that Sanhedrin court among all the Jewish authorities, and he feared them. And therefore, he was a secret disciple, looking for the kingdom of God, didn't think they did Jesus right in putting him to death, morally, and his relationship with God and others, according to the standard in which they live by, is good. The Bible says he's righteous. He was just in his dealings. Yet, he was a secret disciple. Oh, but he was bold. He was, he was bold in wanting the body of Jesus. He went boldly to Pilate and as for the body of Jesus, he took him. He put clean linen cloth about him. He buried him in his new tomb, in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. And he wanted that body and he buried him. Nobody else was doing it. Nobody else was involved in taking that body and showing honor to it. But Joseph of Arimathea did. And he's bold with Pilate after the Jesus' death, knowing he didn't deserve to die, but he's going to honor him. He was a disciple, you know. He was a secret disciple. What do you think about secret disciples? More importantly, what does God think about that? This came to my mind when you had ISIS and you had people in reporters and they were doing things across the ISIS land where they were indeed beheading people. They weren't just beheading Americans. There was occasion where some of the reporters, they were going to be beheaded because they were Christians. That's why they were going to be beheaded. And they denounced the fact that they were Christians. Is God okay with that? He got out of trouble. You know, 
They, they let Paul escape from a, in a basket in Damascus. Jesus says that you flee, that you flee sometimes and when the, the persecution comes. I may get out of harm's way, but it, it puts, puts it on the basis, do you, do you believe in Jesus? Can you be secret about that and please God? We have to read closer to our Bibles and realize I'll be faithful even unto death. Revelation 2.10. I'll give you the crown of life. That didn't mean I'll just live my life and about 85, 90 years old I'll die. I'll be faithful all the way through my life. No, we're going to put you to death for being a Christian. Even if it means your death. Yes, I'll be faithful to God. I think the Bible frowns on secret discipleship. And we shall see as we unlock the, what the Bible does say about these things, but realizing here was one that was a secret disciple. Now, it is interesting to me about secrets. Why are some secrets easy to hide? Because when you've got a secret, sometimes it's easy to tell it. Right? You know some that just can't keep a secret, don't you? What do you do? I don't tell them secrets. They just, for some reason, got to tell it. Why is that the case? And yet, some families have bones deep in the closets. They'll never tell you their secrets. Why is that? Because it's about me. And these other little things are about you or somebody else. Tidbits. Because, they're, you know, a whisperer. The words of a whisperer, they're like dainty, dainty morsels. They go deep down into the innermost parts. We hear some gossip. We hear some things that are titillating. And, but they're about somebody else. And we might tell those things to others. You know what that, that person did? You know what they're doing? You know what they're acting like? And... And uh, it might not be very favorable to them. That's okay. We won't hide it. I just got to tell you, I'm in the know, you know. But there's some secrets easy to hide because they expose us deep inside. And so we'll hide it. I think that's what we see in discipleship. Because Joseph Arimathea was indeed a secret disciple, and we know the reason, one of the reasons why, this wouldn't be very favorable. Joseph, you're a coward. Oh, we wouldn't want that to be said about us, would we? But that's what he was. Cowardice. He feared the Jews. He feared man. But that's not the only person that's ever done that, or what we see in the New Testament. You remember the man that was born blind? His parents would know that he was born blind. And now he's being healed. He could see. And it comes down when they're asked the question about this. And they want to, the people want to know about, well, is, is, was he really healed, born blind, and so forth? He says, these things said his parents because they feared the Jews. What did they say? Verse 21, how now he seeth, we know not how that happened. Or who opened his eyes, we know not. Ask him. He's of age. We'll just keep it, our thoughts to ourselves. We'll be secret. He is of age. Ask him. He can speak for himself. Why did they say this? Because deep down, there was cowardice. Because they knew that anyone, the Jews had agreed that if any man should confess him to be Christ, and why wouldn't you? He just healed your son of blindness. He didn't get blindness at five years old playing with guns. He was born blind. You know it. We'll let him speak. Because they fear man. And if you got them, talked to them, and they had to face that, that wouldn't be very strong character, would it? I can keep that secret. I can hide that I believe Jesus is the Christ. Oh, there were people saying things about Jesus in John 7 and verse 13. There were some saying, he's leading the multitude astray. Others said, no, he's a good man. But they would not speak openly about him. We'll keep it a secret because they feared the Jews. They feared men. 
Do you fear men? Do you fear the Taliban? Frightening? Because you're a Christian, you'll be beheaded tomorrow morning? Do you squirm and get out of that or be like John the Baptist? Be like Paul? But secret discipleship is also because people are ashamed. And the shame comes out this way. We will not acknowledge that I'm a Christian. Maybe not a fear, but the idea of being ashamed of, of you're a Christian. And that gets more and more away in our society because more and more Christianity is not favored. You got more and more people that are atheists and they get in charge and they do not like anything about Christianity. They make fun of it. They ridicule it idea of based upon the blood of Jesus Christ how barbaric is that and you get thinking well maybe I'm not sophisticated enough maybe I I'm not uh, I'm not going to be accepted by people so I will be quiet I'll be I'll believe in him but I'll be a secret disciple and you know what flies in the face if I'm that way I'd, I'd like to keep that secret I'll be ashamed so I'll be a secret disciple and what flies in the face of that, God's not ashamed of his people. Those who are looking for a city, God says, I've got one for you. And I will not be ashamed to be their God. How dare I would ever be ashamed of God. He's not ashamed of his people. Why is his people, why are his people ashamed of him? Jesus is not ashamed of us. He that is sanctified and he that sanctifies are all one. And, God, and Jesus is not ashamed to call them his brethren. He went to the cross. He took on the shame of crucifixion. But he's not ashamed of you. Why at those critical moments are you ashamed of him? To call him, I am a Christian. I belong to Christ. I belong to Jesus Christ. Paul's not ashamed. Paul was not ashamed of the gospel. And that's why he was ready to come to Rome and preach unto them the gospel, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation. The most important thing that we can do for mankind, save them from their sins, is the power of God to do that. Righteousness of God is found in the gospel. He would never be ashamed of that. In 2 Timothy, the first chapter, in verse 12, because he knows his Lord, and he knows him intimately, we'll find that this is how he feels about it. I, I thank him that counted me, counted me faithful. And I'm, I'm, that's sec, first Timothy. 2 Timothy 1, 12. For which cause I suffer also these things. I'm a preacher, apostle, teacher, in verse 11. Of course, he has brought to light the immortality, the light of the gospel in verse 10. I was appointed a preacher and a teacher. So that's, that's my mission. That's the gospel I have to proclaim. And I'm not ashamed, for I know him whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to guard that which I've committed unto him against that day. Salvation is from the grave is coming. The crown of righteousness, victory over sin and death through Jesus Christ is mine one day to have. Why would I ever be ashamed? Because I know that's in store for even after I'm beheaded. They didn't take away that. It's just a process. How will you die? How will you die? Well, I like to die quickly like a, with a heart attack. Won't have to suffer much. I've heard that a lot. I understand that. I like to die having my, my thoughts intact. And I've seen people they lose, their, lose that ability. That's horrible. I don't want to die like that. Would you like to die a martyr's death? Oh, we say, yeah. And then we sitting in prison waiting. But Paul said, I want the fellowship of his sufferings, the power of his resurrection. 
That was just a process to go through. And that's the way we need to look at that. Sometimes we're ashamed of this great eternal plan when God's not ashamed of his people to be called their God, when Jesus is not ashamed of us, when he sanctified us, why would we ever turn and be ashamed of him? But we sometimes do. We get in the crowd and we won't let anybody know we're a Christian. Because it's not sophisticated enough. Shame on us. But to bring that out, you know, in front of you, you that, that, that would be a secret you want to keep down deep. That was a secret you'll keep. And I would keep because it is so shameful. But the Bible says we are admonished not to be ashamed. In the context of persecution, in 1 Peter 4 and verse 16, we observe the fact that this is a trial that we're being tested. It's, it's a cleansing process that we're going through. It sanctifies us. A fiery trial has come upon to prove you. Don't think a strange thing has happened because it's occurring, verse 12 of 1 Peter 4. We're not to be getting other people's matters and suffering from that or suffer as a murderer. We'd be executed. But he says, but if a man suffer as a Christian, even being put to death, yes. Being made fun of, yes. Mocked, yes. All, all sorts of persecution. But if he suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. But let him glorify God in this name. Yes, I am a Christian. And you're not going to take away my hope. You're not going to take away my crown. Get on with it. Or just be silent. And be in the presence of God knowing that you're approved of him. Because he's taught us that, that we're supposed to be that way. And that we're not to be ashamed. He said, don't be ashamed, but glorify God in this name. When it comes your ability and opportunity to do that. In 2 Timothy 1 and verse 8, he's trying to give courage to a young Timothy as a preacher. Be not ashamed. Timothy, be not ashamed, therefore, of the testimony of our Lord. That here comes the testimony, the teachings of the Lord, and we back off because we're ashamed. Because we're going to have to step on somebody's toes. We're going to have to bring forth something that may not want to hear. I'll be silent. I'll be secret. I'm a disciple, but they don't know. I'll be ashamed of the testimony, nor of me as prisoner. I don't know Paul. Don't have anything to do with him. But suffer hardship with the gospel according to the power of God. You suffer through it, whatever it is. But you do not deny the Lord. You do not become ashamed of him and his teachings. You know why? Because one day he'll be ashamed of you. I thought he said he wouldn't be ashamed of us. Well, we're sanctified. He sanctifies. We're all one. But if you want to look at a passage to teach someone the cost of discipleship, and we say, well, we need to count the cost. And you need to realize here's a, maybe someone you're studying with, and, and they need to understand what the cost of discipleship is. It's not all about grace and forgiveness, and, and we're going to have joy. And all this. It's demanding. And to take a passage, if you have one day in a, in a garage with somebody, sitting on the front porch, Mark the 8th chapter is perfect. For that. Peter didn't like the idea that Jesus was going to have to die. And Peter rebuked him for this lesson. But what did he say in verse 31? He began to teach him the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the scribes be killed, and three days rise up. What's the gospel? His death, burial, and resurrection. What a place to start teaching somebody the gospel. And he just said, that's what was going to happen to him. Peter said, no. Can you imagine Peter rebuking Jesus? And Jesus rebuked him back. He rebuked him back. And then he begins to give the details. You know, Peter, get behind me, Satan. You mind the things of men. I'm going to be 
turned over to the authorities. They're going to kill me. I'll be raised from the dead. And he says, called him the multitude with his disciples, said, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Whosoever shall lose his life for my sake, the gospel's sake, shall save it. Count the cost. But in losing, you save. Yes, there's going to be persecution. It'll be difficult. What did the profit if a man gained the whole world and forfeit his life? But what should a man give in exchange for his life, meaning his soul? For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation when they needed to know what the light of the gospel is and we're silent because we don't think they'll receive it well. We'll just be a secret disciple. It's easy to keep this secret because we're ashamed when we come in the context of men. He says, if you do that, the Son of Man shall also be ashamed of him when he cometh in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. What big a crowd will you buckle under? Will they be college educated? Will they be bosses? Will they be a group of people that you respect as far as this world is concerned? And you want their respect, but they don't respect Christianity. What big a crowd will it be? It won't be as big as the angels coming with the Lord. It won't be as important realizing before the Father and his holy angels, here is Jesus being ashamed of me. You can cancel me. You can kick me out of the teaching program. I'm not going to have Jesus be ashamed of me. But that's what keeps people secret. Disciples. In addition to cowardice and being ashamed, sometimes people are silent because of popularity. They desire to be popular. So the idea of being ashamed and, and maybe not be looked upon, but I, I want their approval. I desire popularity. This is what people believed. Here were rulers in John the 12th chapter. They're rulers that indeed they believed on Jesus. They saw the evidence, miraculous evidence. They understood that. They saw and, and realized what it led them to. He said, nevertheless, even of the rulers, many believed on him. But because the Pharisees, they did not confess it lest they should be put out of the synagogue. I thought, preacher, that was your point on being afraid. That's that point of being afraid, because that was the point. But look what he adds here. Be put out of the synagogue, for they love the glory that is of men more than the glory that is of God. I'd rather be praised by men. Yeah, they might kick me out, but what's deep down there? What's deep down there that you will, you'll just will be able to live with it? I, I, I want to be accepted by them. I want to be popular among them. I want the glory of men more than the glory of God. Isn't it interesting we make choices? It's not that we don't want the glory of God. And in the glory of God, yes, I want to be pleased. I'm a disciple, you know. But when it comes down to the time, like Joseph Arimathea, I, I, I believe in Jesus and, and I think they did him wrong and he was a secret disciple. He boldly asked for the body. There was some strength in him, but he was still a secret disciple because he feared man. But think about it. It's not that we don't want the, we want the glory of men more than the glory of God. That's astounding. That's sad if that's really what's deep in our heart. And you try to say, well, there's just not enough evidence for Christianity. Is that the problem? Or is that the group you hang around? You want their, they want your approval and they're not going to accept you. I'll take the glory of men more than the glory of God. And that's what we see, we need to be reminded, you're going to be a friend of the world, you're an enemy of God. You're enmity with God. 
Whosoever is a, makes friendship with the world is enmity with God. James, the fourth chapter and verse four. There were people who were lovers of money that were Jews, and Jesus dealt with that. You've got to make up your mind. You're going to serve God or mammon. And they didn't like it. And he says, the things that you exalt, those are the things that Jesus condemns and God condemns and looks down upon. But men exalt that. Money and prestige and all the things that went with it are the things that they like. They justify themselves in the sight of men, but God knoweth their hearts and that which is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. So you want to go the route of the world and be popular with them? You have that choice. And in a moment of soberness, I would think, I would rather have the glory of men than glory of my creator? That's crazy. No, that's practical. I'll still believe in Jesus somewhere in my heart, but it'll be secret because I'd rather be popular than to, to go against what men would say. We should not seek to please men. God, Paul lived it, he taught it. When people were trying to bring Judaism in to play with the gospel and let's circumcise them along with the gospel and save us by our sins and have that Jewish input, Paul said, no, you perverted the gospel. You're not going to be justified by the law of Moses. Circumcision does you no good. And you're the, the only the gospel you'd accept is what Paul preached. And if there's any other matter, if there's any other gospel, let him be anathema. Am I still pleasing men? Am I pleasing men or, or God? I could not be a servant of God if I please men. That's how Paul thought about it. And it was very true. When he comes to Thessalonica, and the type of teaching and the character from which that teaching came from of, of men such as Paul, he could set it up there and realize, you know, everything was straightforward. And in that context, verse 3 says, Our exhortation is not of error, nor of uncleanness, nor of guile, but even as we have been approved of God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak. It's a big thing. I've been entrusted with that gospel. I'm not going to, I'm not going to pervert it, Lord. But we speak not as pleasing men, but God who proveth our hearts. See, men pleasers sometimes become secret disciples and not speaking the things that they need to do. My appeal to you as we close this sermon is that, dear Christian, you never hide your light, even if it means your death. Your light is to shine. We're reminded of the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus says, you are the light of the world. In the context, a city set up on a hill cannot be hid. It is so, like a city on a hill, you know, it, but it can't be hid. It can't be hid. It's up there. It's high. You can't hide it. That's what we're supposed to be. And you can't be that city of light when you're a secret disciple. You never let the light of the gospel come. Oh, when it's convenient, you do. But not when it's really needed. And it's adulterous and Perverse generation, you were ashamed of the testimony that could save them? And we know the purpose for letting our light shine before we, that they may see our good works, knowing who has authored them, God, and glorify God, glorify the Father in heaven. That's what we live for. And the glory of God seen in your everyday life, husbands and wives and children interacting with one another according to the scriptures. You being honest in your dealings. You going the second mile and trying to help people. You, you might help a lady change a tire. Don't charge her anything. She wants you to have breakfast at the McDonald's and you just... Uh, I did it to help you. And she writes, and she writes, you know who you are. 
You know who you are. She didn't know his name. But there's people like that. That's what Christians do. And we have an opportunity in all facets of our lives, whether we're at school, work, play, to be a Christian. It doesn't take a lot of fanfare. It just takes that moment when they see you and they see the difference in you that you're extolling the things of Christ. You're letting your light shine. You don't put it under a bushel. You don't put it down in the cellar. You put it on a lampstand so all men can see. You want everybody to see it. And that leaves no room. Today I don't want you to see it because I fear men. I'm ashamed in this context with people. I'd rather be popular than be godly. And there's no things in the Bible that condones a secret disciple. It's just a fact that we see one. And we don't want to be that. And when we shine as the light in Luke 30, 11, 33, our, eye, our light must be, in t must be from our lamp of our bodies, our eye, and that works for putting our, our treasures in heaven, but it works here in Luke eleven thirty three. 33. Notice how he sits this, he puts this in the context of our light shining. In Luke eleven thirty three, 33, our eyes to be single. No man, hath, when he hath lighted a lamp, put it in the cellar, neither under a bushel or on a stand, that all may enter into the room and see the light. The lamp of the body is thine eye when the eye is single. I mean, it's not divided. It's focused like a laser beam. And you're not going to, there's no, you know, the waves are not going to be there. It's just kind of like a laser. It's single. The whole body is full of light. And when it is evil, the body is full of darkness. Now listen to this. How could this be? Look therefore whether the light is, is, is in thee be not darkness. They're antithetical to one another. I think even no one knew when the lights went out today. What happened? There's, there's no light. You know it when it's not there. And we have the darkness. But sometimes when the light that is in you is really darkness, just how dark are you? And the only other type of source of light that brings in our bodies the light is, is that light that you don't have a dimmer switch included in the set. You're shining. You don't dim it. You want all to see that. And your body is full of light. Therefore, the whole body be full of light. Having no part dark, it shall be wholly full of light. As when the lamp in its bright shining doth give thee light. We're to be holding forth that word of life. We're to be luminaries. Or to be lights and luminaries are people are shining lights in a, in a dark canopy of sin. That's what we are. And we're stretching for that word. And there's no a secret discipleship going to do that. We're here. And we honor Christ regardless of what man will do. How bright is your light shining for the Lord? And if we have these little things in us, we condemn the switch and we condemn the switch and we condemn the switch. And if that's the light in you, how dark is your heart? Because there's no way of compromising that. We know why Joseph or Arimathea did what he did. He was a good man. He at least he didn't go along with the crowd. He didn't agree with them, but it happened. It happened. And maybe you're a secret disciple now. I want to get your heart cleansed from all of that. And just look how much time Joseph of Arimathea wasted in secret discipleship. He had a lot of good things going for him. But how much time have we wasted because we fear the world more than we want the glory of God? I'm asking you, fearing the world and being popular in the world is not going to save you from hell. Better late than never. Look how much time you've wasted. 
being a secret disciple. Let's be upfront. Let's live lives that indeed we're not ashamed. If someone finds, well, they're, they're a Christian, that's a Christian. We're not perfect, but we can shine as bright as we can shine and we're never going to dim that light. We'll be pleasing in the sight of God. And that may we never, may we never be ashamed and we never become a secret disciple. And therefore, take away the glory of God that needs to be seen in this dark world of sin. This evening, if you're not a Christian, we want to encourage you to become one. Yes, we talked about you better count the cost. You're going to, have to take up your cross and follow. You're going to have to be able to willing to lose my life for the Lord. And knowing that he hasn't taken away my heavenly reward. And that's what I'm going. I want to be with him and see his glory forever and ever. He created me. I'm going to honor him. I'm going to honor Christ who gave me a hope of new creation in Christ. Be saved from my sins. You'll never be ashamed. You'll never be put to shame because you believed in Christ. We can be ashamed of him, but he sanctifies us. He would never be ashamed of those who he sanctifies and are faithful to the end. May we be that people. Start that road. Come be a Christian as we stand, as we sing.